stepped into the role of our Savvy Ladies Board Chair, which it's just a privilege um, to work with her as we move Savvy Ladies forward um, into its next 20 years. As you know, we just celebrated 20 years of Savvy Ladies. We really are rocking and rolling, connecting, using and leveraging technology so we can connect with you, more and more women to connect with financial professionals. And we're really thrilled that um, we have been able to connect last year on the helpline 2,500 women, now moving most likely to 3,000 and our goal would be 5,000 over the next two years. We love bringing you these panels. It is really um, our uh, privilege to bring you these because we can pull in experts to answer your questions. And Lisa Zinerman is one of those experts, a foremost known certified financial litigator. Is She is a member of the American Academy of Certified Financial Litigators. So really, she is the unicorn, someone who has the, the divorce legal knowledge, but the financial knowledge as well. That is tremendous to have. And she is sharing that wisdom and expertise with you. Um, you can read all the accolades here on the screen, but she is quoted um, and sought after for her advice and guidance and quotes and has been seen in the Wall Street Journal, People Magazine, as well as a writer for Forbes Business Council. So really an outstanding person. And Lisa, I turn it over to you to introduce our panelists uh, for this evening. Thank you so much, Judy, and thank you all for attending tonight. I hope it's going to be as great a night as they have been. We've had, this is our, I believe, our fourth panel discussion in the series. We're going to have one more um, next week, but I, I think that we are very fortunate to have Maggie Patrick, who is a financial advisor at Morgan Stanley. Maggie, I've known for many years, and she has been working with women all over the country, rebuilding their financial lives after divorce. She's lectured in my office many years ago, way before COVID, and she is a good friend and um, volunteers for Savvy Ladies. Um, she understands what it takes to get you to where you're going. And we're very fortunate to have Maggie with us. We also have a very good friend of mine, Melina, Melina Denebeim, who is an executive and divorce coach, the founder of MFL Coaching. She is the co-director also of the Program for Financial Studies and G Master of Science in Financial Economics at Columbia Business School. And I have known Melina for years. She is a very wise and um, a very logical woman, and um, she has a lot to share about the process and how to get through it as well. And I think her leadership and her coaching really is extraordinary. So we're going to take it um, from the top, and um, it, it's going to be a great panel. I, I will say, I'm going to give you some statistics tonight before we get started um, with the panel, um, and some of them are a little bit scary. But don't be scared because you've got all this great advice and I am sure that you've got great attorneys and a great team who you're working with. Um, but there's no question that divorced women right now are more likely to be in poverty and receive, believe it or not, public assistance from their from than their male counterparts. And in order to face the challenge of living on their one income, women need to become fearless. And they need to discover ways to leverage their talents to further their careers so that if divorce happens, they are prepared to live on one income. Now, many of you will be receiving support. You'll either be receiving child support or you'll be receiving spousal support or both and an equitable distribution of assets. So you will be fine. But there are many women who actually are not that fortunate and who actually have to survive on that one income. And even if you're receiving the spousal support and the child support and the equitable distribution, if you have been a woman who has been a stay-at-home mom for many years, it's going to be much harder, frankly, for you to get out there and to climb that corporate ladder or to climb the ladder. And so we are here to help you do that, to make the most of the knowledge that you have and the finances that you will either have now or you will have in the future. And so um, I think it's really important to know that there is life after divorce. I think that um, many of us have gone through it and we have come out on the other side and we are better for it. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, please just have hope 
and work with whoever your counsel is and your financial advisors are and your team of experts, and you will get there. So Maggie, can you tell us, um, first of all, um, thank you so much for being here. Can you tell us um, what kind of work you do in terms of preparing women during their divorce and then after their divorce? Thank you, Lisa. Thanks for the introduction. So great to be here supporting Savvy Ladies. I'm really proud to support your mission. Um, and I'm also a helpline volunteer. So I may have spoken with some of the people on the call already. Um, so yeah, I'm a financial advisor at Morgan Stanley for 13 years uh, or so. I've been helping women to um, begin rebuilding their lives and finding their way to financial stability after divorce. Um, and I think, you know, one of the best things that you can do is find a financial advisor that you trust and someone you connect with. And when you meet with them, you know, what you're going to begin to do is really to know what you have. What I say is know what you have and know how much it costs to be you. That's really like, that's the foundation of, you know, your financial rebirth is to kind of take a, an assessment of where you are and where you, you know, you're, what your starting point is. And that's how you're going to plan out what your trajectory is going to be. Now, when you say um, to figure out where you are and where you want to be, um, I think of that very first form that people get when they mm -hmm. are going through their divorce. And Melina, um, I think you're familiar with the form that I'm talking about, that statement of net worth. Um, can you tell us what people need to think about when they're filling out the statement of net worth? I think Maggie, you're on. Do you want to take that one or you want me to take it? If you could take it, Melina. Okay, sure. Um, thanks, everybody. It really is a pleasure to be here. And I can tell you that even though it has been seven years since I was formally divorced and about eight and a half years since I started the process, I still have a visceral and emotional memory of what it's like to be in your shoes if you're going through a divorce. I just wanna start off by saying that um, I'm out of the woods, I'm living life, I am happy. Um, I have a daughter who's 10. I have a wonderful, I'm, I'm engaged. I have a wonderful partner um, eight years later, but I wanna say that it is hard and there is a process and there's a, a reinvention that you go through. So I just want everyone on the call to know this evening that Maggie's a professional, I'm a professional, but by no means are we above you, we are with you. So I just wanna start off by saying that. Okay, let's get down to finances. So. The statement of net worth is really just a simple budget. Let's take it like in two parts. One is like the day-to-day -day expenses that you have, and it's broken down into categories. I mean, there's categories like restaurants, food, alcohol, pet supplies, kid vacations, camps and activities, um, uh, grocery expenditures, your rent or your mortgage, your, um, your car expenditures, gas, tolls, et cetera. It's kind of broken down into all these tiny little buckets to get you to understand what it costs to be you, like Lisa said. However, that's one part. And that's really the segment where I kind of, honestly, Lisa, don't yell at me. I rushed through it just to kind of get numbers down. <laughs> no, you did okay. not, Melina. <laughs> <laughs> I sure did. Yeah. I'm terrible because I was scared. I had a real fear of looking at these numbers. And mm -hmm. I think that it took me until after my divorce to be comfortable enough to kind of sit down and then own those numbers. Mm -hmm. So try and, and disassociate yourself from the cost because the biggest cost are the legal fees often when you're going through a divorce and you're looking at all these other costs and it can be scary, but really if you spend time to understand your expense structure, you have power. You have power over those numbers. You have power mm -hmm. to adjust them. You have power to change them. But by staying in the dark and rushing through it or avoiding it or thinking that you spend something without actually running through your credit card statements or running through your, running through your debit card statements that help you categorize expenses, mm -hmm. um, you're really just delaying the inevitable, which is figuring out your budget. Now, also on the statement of net worth, you have assets and liabilities, and those are really just fancy terms for how much money you have 
but you don't use on a day-to-day -day basis. It sits somewhere, whether it sits physically in a house as equity, whether it sits physically in a bank, um, whether it sits physically in a retirement fund. Um, those are assets. They are worth something. They're worth something in the market, they're worth something on paper, and they're worth something to you. Then there's the, li the liabilities, which is just another fancy word for saying debt. And liabilities mean, do you owe people anything? Do you owe a car dealership a car lease? Do you owe a bank a mortgage? Do you owe um, student loans? Do you owe anything to family members contractually or off the books? Do you owe anything that you've taken out a loan for? There could be a million different things, but that helps you figure out at the end of the day, taking your assets, which is like the plus sign, and taking your liabilities, which is like the minus sign. So you subtract the liabilities from the assets and you figure out what you actually have. At the end of the day, if you had to liquidate everything, what would be sitting in leftover? That's great, Melina. And it's a great explanation. And I am going to take one moment to say you really don't want to race through the net worth statement. And I'm going to yeah. tell you why. Okay. And, and Melina knew this was coming anyway, because she prefaced it. But here's the thing. That is a document that is going to follow you through your entire um, divorce. Mm -hmm. And it is also the document that you're going to be grilled on in any deposition. It is the document you're going to be submitting to the court and swearing to. It's the document that the judge is going to be relying on in terms of how to um, how to allocate support, legal fees, expert fees, um, all of that. And it's really important. And to Melina's point, it's really important to get a handle on your expenses because you also are going to need to know what are the things that I really have to have? What's the number I really have to have when I'm, when I'm finished here? Um, mm -hmm. And what are the things that maybe I won't have to have because maybe um, my spouse is not going to be living with me. So the food budget is going to be cut. Maybe we're not going to be all dining out anymore together. So that's going to be cut. Maybe your kids are going off to college at some point. So there's different, there will be different expenses. But Maggie, when you do the net worth statement, um, I usually tell people to look back for a full year. What do you do? Um, I do the same. I, I ask people to bring in bank statements for a year. I think it's really helpful, um, especially because, you know, your costs in the winter, your electricity costs in December are going to be different from your electricity costs in July. Um, so it's really good to get a range. You know, we spend a, a lot of time on it sometimes, you know, and take an average, you know, so it's as accurate as possible. And I 100% agree with what you're saying, Lisa, that I have seen that um, things that you leave out or that you skimp on in the net worth statement will come back to haunt you if you don't accurately depict what you're spending. And, and this is sort of like a time, uh, it's no time to be embarrassed or you know what I mean? You really want to get it precise because if it isn't precise, those may be things that you're not able to do in the future. So um, exactly, right? It's Don't also it. okay, by the way, I always tell clients, it's okay not to know. Like if you right. don't know what the expense is, then it's a very simple TBD, right? To be determined. Mm -hmm. And there are going to be several ways to figure it out, including with you know somebody like you, Maggie, um, to work with and to figure out what the lifestyle analysis is and what that looks like and what those expenses were. And you're going to get your spouse's net worth statement as well to look at. You're going to get all these documents during your divorce um, that you're going to have more documents than you know what to do with, but you're going to be able to look through those and maybe the second net worth statement that you do, and there may be several during a uh, matrimonial action, the second net worth statement you do, you'll be able to fill in those DVDs with accuracy and so it's better to leave the to be determines as to be determines than to guess. Or, mm -hmm. you know, if you are approximating, say it, say approximately, and you can put an asterisk, not sure because my spouse has the information or not sure because I didn't pay that bill or whatever it is. But it's really important that you, you have that. The other thing is that I always like people to put on their net worth statement, what time period they're using, because it could be, a year and a half from then that you're literally looking at that net worth statement. Somebody's asking you what time period did you use? And you're not going to necessarily remember. 
so mm-hmm. important. What um what are the biggest issues in terms of um when when you're coming to the closure, when you're coming to the settlement, Maggie? What are the biggest issues that you believe people could confront at that point? Yeah, I think I think there's a couple that I I um, have in mind, but really the the top one that I see over and over again, and I'm sure that many people on this call it's on their mind, um, is what is going to be done with the marital home. That that's really um, it looms the largest in in people's minds for a lot of reasons. You know, especially if you have children, it's often your biggest asset. It's an asset that you share with the person that you're getting divorced from, and it's very tricky to find um, the detachment from the emotional baggage surrounding it to find your way to a really good decision about what is the best thing to do. And and that's actually one of the major reasons that I encourage everyone here to speak with a financial professional because you can get a very objective opinion if you're speaking with someone who's experienced in these matters and experienced in divorced issues. Um, as to what you should do. And and I've seen everyone, you know, what, another thing to remember too, and I know that Lisa does a lot of this, is that people do come up with a whole range of creative solutions to these problems. There's no reason that you can't figure out a creative path through divorce. But, you know, I, I would say that, um, and we talked about this um, before the call, that holding on to the house purely out of, um, you know, uh, an emotional attachment to the house or desire to uh, allow uh, the children to have a continuity of their experience and their childhood and not to be disrupted by the divorce, maybe out of guilt. You really want to watch out for those issues because it's not necessarily the best financial decision. And, uh, and either one of you can answer this. Um, why, what are the um, issues in terms of holding on to the house financially? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I can say one thing and then uh, Melina, maybe you can um, give your own experience. But um, one thing that I often see is that people say, well, I'm going to get this divorce settlement. I'm getting half of the retirement accounts and then I'm getting a nice lump sum. We had a nice savings or a nice investment account and I'm getting half of that. Why don't I just use that to buy out my spouse? And it may seem like a no brainer. Oh, nothing has to change because I'm getting whatever it is, 50, $100,000 in my settlement. Well, here's the thing. The entire picture has changed. (laughs) Life has changed. And when you get divorced and Whereas you were moving along toward retirement with two incomes, or maybe one income, your spouse's, now you're responsible for your own retirement. And whatever settlement you get, that's your new nest egg. And really, your job is to take care of it and, you know, be a good steward and help it to grow to ensure your own security financial security in the future. And I can't emphasize enough the degree to which a home is not necessarily the key to a secure financial future. Um, it It's actually, in many ways, an enormous burden, I think, for a lot of women who choose to stay in the home. And I'm not trying to say it's always a bad idea. It's sometimes it, it's very smooth and it works fine. But I don't think it's necessarily a no-brainer to go ahead and use that money for that purpose. So there are certain costs. Go ahead, Melina, please. I I think I was going to preempt your question about all the costs associated with the house. But there's also a really strong um, component of freedom and optionality if you let go of the home. But let me start with the costs. So it's, it's everyone knows there's a cost to carrying a house, right? You pay tax property taxes. Okay, you pay, well, the, you pay the interest on the mortgage, which is tax deductible, but it's not a one-to-one tax deductibility. Um, so consider that your cost of like renting the house. Then you pay maintenance on the house and houses are big. 
they cost a lot, electricity, gas bills. They, you have your cable bills, your internet bills, and then the Netflix, the, all of your streaming that adds up in, in terms of your bundled cost of all the things that go in the house. And then there's the repairs. So if you think about owning your house, let's say you plan to own your house for the next five to 10 years until your kids are out of the house. Let's just give a broad example. If you're spending costs on getting someone to check the refrigerator, that costs like $150, $200 to get a technician and just to check the fridge, let alone replace parts. What if you have to replace the fridge? That's, I just replaced a fridge. It was like 1400 cheap fridge, 1400 on Home Depot, but with the delivery costs, the installation costs and the taxes, it was $2,000. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna have utility costs, you're going to have replacement and repair costs. You have to repaint every so often, five to 10 years, you're gonna have to get a new roof. Um, there is the cost of maintaining the exterior of the house, even if you pay someone to come once a month to do your gardening or trimming or landscaping or twice a month, those costs add up. Um, and so when you're thinking about the real cost to own the house, and if you have a housekeeper, for example, you pay them $150 to come clean your house twice a month. These are costs that add up and you don't think of them really as house costs in your mind and when they come out of your bank account. But mm -hmm. I urge all of you when you're thinking about this cost benefit analysis, how much of your cash flow, your monthly cash flow, because this doesn't come out of the value of the house. This is out of pocket expenses. How much are you really going to be spending every month and every year just to maintain and own that house? Because that is what can bankrupt people and force a sale. And the last thing you want to be is in a position where you're forced to sell an asset, where you're forced to sell your most valuable asset, right. most likely, because then you will be desperate and 90% chance you're not going to get the value of the house that it's really worth or that you want. Um, and so you want to have the choice and not be forced into a situation because you're, you're house rich, but cash poor. And it's a real thing. I mean, I've experienced, mm -hmm. I, I've, I've experienced a lot of both sides of those and it's tough because mm -hmm. you think you have a certain quality and standard of life, but then you're saying no to your kids for sleepaway camps. Mm -hmm. You're saying no to your family for extra vacations or a vacation because you have so many hidden frictional costs associated with that house. Mm -hmm. um, they're real and they don't come out of equity in the house. They don't, your house may be worth a million. It may be worth 500,000. That doesn't matter. Okay. You are what you're getting in every month. You have to look at that minus what you're paying out every month to maintain that house. There's also then, costs. Yeah. Go ahead. I, no, no, I want to ahead. talk about the costs of, so there are costs actually when you go to sell your house. So mm -hmm. Melina, you talked about buying your spouse out of the house and there are specific costs, Maggie, maybe you could speak to this, um, that are when you are actually going to sell your house. So you've now bought your spouse out of the house mm -hmm. and you haven't had to pay, you haven't had to been able to deduct the um, brokerage fee because there was no broker, right. right, at that point. And nobody knew for sure that you were going to be selling the house or keeping the house. And there were other costs that you're and taxes that you're going to incur at the time that you sell that house later. What are those? Right, exactly. Well, the biggest one that um, a lot of people do not anticipate um, is that just like any investment, you will have to pay a capital gains tax on the sale of your house. So if you've been living in your home long enough and you're fortunate that you've had a, a large gain in your house, um, you will be taxed on it, but only to the amount that is above the exclusion. So if it's you and your spouse selling the house together, your exclusion is gonna be $500,000. So if you're fortunate enough that your um, home has gone up more than $500,000 and you're selling it with your spouse, you will be taxed on 50% if that's your share of the proceeds of the house that is over that 500. So if the house was 100,000 when you bought it, you sell it for 650, you will be paying taxes on that $50,000 because that's 500 over the original cost. 
And keep in mind, the 500 is for when you were selling it with your spouse, right? Now you're not selling it with your spouse. So you don't get 500,000, you get 250,000. Exactly, right. So if you keep it, that's a good point, Lisa. So if you keep it, that's really what we were talking about. If you hold on to the house yourself, and say, finally, when your kids are out of the house, you say, okay, I did it for the kids. I'm done. I'm out. Well, if you still have that $500,000 gain on that $100,000 house, you're going to owe a lot more in taxes because you're only going to get the exclusion for one person, which is $250,000. So the house sells for six hundred. dollars you know, The first three fifty, dollars you're okay. And anything over that, it's going to be another 250000 that you owe probably a 15% tax on. It's a healthy, healthy amount of tax. So, you know, there, there's, so many, um, there's so many ways in which I, I just try to sort of steer people to open their minds to the possibility of doing something different of even you know a lot of people look down on renting but I have to tell you I think renting is really really underrated I think it's actually over time less expensive than owning a house so and Maggie and and not only is renting all in all I mean it can be less expensive than owning a house Um, there's a great article in the Atlantic by the way and I get all these articles on the housing market because people are trying Mm -hmm. to figure it out right now with Mm -hmm. high interest rates but a, a supply shortage and why housing prices are through the roof right. and when are costs going to equalize. But there's a lot of articles out there. And I really like this one in the Atlantic. I was going to try and forward it to you guys, but I think it's password, you know, you have to be a login, but it is about the misconception of mm-hmm. this white picket fence fantasy that the government essentially has incentivized people to create. Um, there's a strong government incentive to own. And so that's not the right economics, though. And I really like the points that Maggie and Lisa are making. Um, but OK, economics are economics. What about the emotions? And what are you gaining or what are you giving up by getting the house? Well, think about the flip side. If you're not buying your spouse out, your spouse is buying you out. So just by leaving the house, you're getting extra money, right? Mm-hmm. You're getting half of what the appreciation over the base value and the fees and all the um, renovation costs, anything, but you're getting half of that if, you're, if your spouse decides to keep the house, right? And if you sell it, you're getting half of what you sold it for versus what you bought it for plus the transaction costs and any renovations. So you're getting more money in your bank by not staying in the house. That's a really important point. And let me tell you what a couple of people have done by taking the harder road, which is the road, the path of the un- unknown. So people, we all like to hold on to what's secure and what's known. When we mm-hmm. don't know the future, it's really scary. Um, but you don't know what the future brings. You don't know what your life's going to look like two years out. You don't have any clue what your life is going to look like five years out, even if you have kids. You really cannot predict. Now, I have a friend who sold her house um, in Tenafly, New Jersey. And she sold it a few, two years after the divorce. And she spent those two years trying to renovate it to get it market ready to sell. So she put a bunch of money into it and she sold it. And she sold it and got a, re- a pretty good price for it and pocketed some money. But what she said to me, she said to me, Melina, I'm selling, I, I, don't, I will never forget this conversation. I think I almost fainted. She said, I'm selling my house, or I sold my house. And I've been applying to PhD programs. Mind you, she's in her late 40s, mid 40s. I'm applying to PhD programs and I got into one to study corporate governance and I'm going to Norway to study under a famous professor and pursue my (laughs) PhD. And I was like, what? Are you crazy? She goes, I've been dreaming of this day where I can go back to school and I have the money to do it now that I sold my Mm -hmm. house. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's going to make a lot more money ultimately, either teaching or using her PhD in whatever fashion she ends up using it in. But I was like spellbound by her decision because I I didn't anticipate that from her. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I'll tell you another quick story. I decided not to stay in my marital residence. Um, In fact, I told Lisa at every court conference, which was every five weeks for a year and nine months, (laughs) I said, get me out of this house. 
I think someone wrote in the chat, it's bad juju. It's, it was bad. It was like being haunted by ghosts. Um, I didn't want to look at furniture that was shared. I didn't want to like live in the walls where trauma had happened. Right. Um, and I also, and, and I, so I thought about it from a financial perspective, I wanted to pay out. But what I really thought about was number one, I have a chance, I was in New York City, I have a chance to move to a better public school district for my daughter. So I moved to like a 10 out of 10 insightschools.org and nine out of 10 insightschools.org neighboring school districts where my daughter could go to either one. That was liberating because I didn't have to even, in my mind, think about private school, think about how not great her school was in our current area. And that was probably one of the best decisions I could have made for my daughter just by leaving the area. Not going too far, but going far enough to be zoned differently. The next thing was that I had this chunk of money and I, I have dreamed for, I think before uh, getting a divorce for 10 years of owning real estate and trying to make money through real estate. And I'd never done that, never thought about how. And the universe sort of aligned and I found um, a property in Connecticut on the shoreline that was really inexpensive. It was like original 1950s, really cheap. And I decided I was gonna buy this house, put a little bit of money into it and then rent it out full time. And I, did, I ran the numbers, I'm a numbers person, so I ran the numbers and I was gonna make several thousand dollars a month on this rental. So I did it and I was scared beyond belief. I had never invested in anything like that, but it ended up giving me an extra $2,000 a month in my pocket on a monthly basis. And the house appreciated so much during the first two years that I owned it, I was able to do a cash out refinancing where I just upped my mortgage by the amount that the house had appreciated. And I took that chunk of money and I bought a second house and did the exact same thing with it which now again gives me another $2,000 a month in my pocket. Um, and that's after paying the mortgage, after paying the taxes, after paying the maintenance. So I just created basically like the equivalent of another job of income by taking my settlement, instead of staying in the home, the marital home, I've invested in real estate. Um, it's not that easy to do, it's not an easy thing, but it was something that whatever you choose to do with that money, whether it's invest in your education, to get a better job in the future, or invest in something that's gonna pay you as an investment or just sock it away in the market, S&P 500, or put it into a 5% CD, um, you're making money. Like if you have $100,000 sitting in a bank account that's earning, sorry, in let's say the equity markets and you're earning 7% a year, right? That's, that's $100,000, 7% a year, which by the way, the S&P over the past five years has returned 10% a year. Um, you are then doubling your money in 10 years, okay? Doubling your money. Yes, there's inflation. Yes, there's taxes. So, so haircut it, discount it a little bit. But on a raw basis, your hundred's going to like 196,000. Now let's say your, your retirement horizon is 20 years. That goes up to approximately, the same number goes up to about 400,000. Or your hundred thousand today earning seven percent a year, compounding the interest over twenty years, you're earning you're gonna have four hundred thousand dollars in the future. So your money doesn't do that in a house. It's different. Um, and and it's save it. Save the money for something you may have unexpected expenses too. Uh, you may have medical bills, you may have costs associated with your children. Give yourself flexibility. Plus you may end up dating someone in the future and you wanna to move to a different town. And the last thing you want is to find the love of your life and be stuck, be stuck with a house or be stuck not being able to build a house, a life with him or her because you have already this fixed cost in your life that's weighing you down. Maggie, um, in terms of picking a financial advisor, mm -hmm. so you're a financial advisor, tell, let's go through it because there are people I'm sure who are on, who are starting to think, as I said, about settlement, about um, coming to a resolution, about what do they do next? Maybe um, they were the ones who are managing the money, but maybe their spouse was. How do they pick a financial advisor? Can you tell us what the differences are? Because I know sure. that it gets kind of complicated. It is, it is complicated and it's a very intimidating world and I wish it wasn't that way. Um, and I do my best to break that stereotype. Um, but 
what I would say is that you want to look for someone who holds a, a, a certification, a respected certification, and probably in my field, you, you know, one of the most respected certifications is the CFP, which is a certified financial planner. And so if someone has the letter CFP after their name, you know that they uh, know quite a bit about financial planning and about numerous aspects of um, of finance and in including investing and making portfolios. Um, so I would say that's number one, that's the case. Um, Lisa and I also both hold the C CDFA, which is that we're certified divorce financial analysts, which is a certification that um, de demonstrates a knowledge of how the process of divorce is affects your finances. Um, so I would say that either of those designations is a, is a really good one to spot. Um, I generally encourage people to shy away from discount brokerages myself personally. It's not, this is, you know, a personal opinion just because I don't think, I think that when you're in this situation, it's great to have a person who knows you and knows your life and understands what's going on with you. And you have a one-to-one -one relationship with that person rather than calling up you know, exam for example, Fidelity or somewhere like that, where you're you're calling essentially a call center um, and, and not speaking. Um, you're speaking to someone who has some financial background and some expertise, but you don't really know what. I would rather see the women that you know. I want to help. I want to see them talking to someone who they know and trust. So I think um, it's really important. You want to feel like someone is not talking down to you. Is really mostly listening and not talking and that you understand what you're discussing. If you don't understand what's being discussed and you don't really feel like you can ask probing questions, it's probably not a good start. So, you know, you do have to sort of shop around. It's not unlike, frankly, shopping for a divorce attorney. You know, you have to feel like you connect on some level and that you're able to communicate your needs effectively with that person. So. Yeah. And is there a difference, Maggie, in percentages on how people pay their financial advisor? Talk yeah. to me a little bit about that, because I even find sure. that confusing. It is confusing. So um, kind of the fashionable thing these days is to um, find a fee-based financial advisor. So what that means is that they will collect a fee annually, um, which is usually around 1% of your assets. Um, so if you have $500,000, it's $5,000 a year. If you have 100,000, it's 1,000 a year. Um, so that is one way that people charge. Another way is kind of the old fashioned sales charge or commission on a trade. So anytime you buy or sell or not you sell, but usually just buy a stock, um, you would pay a commission on the trade. So you might say, why would I do that if I could do a fee based? Well, the truth is that over time, it's possible that it's more expensive for you to do a fee based as opposed to commission. If you are doing something as Melina suggested, just buying the S&P 500 and just buying an ETF that represents that index, you may be just buying and holding that investment. And there is no reason to be paying 1% per year on that investment. If you have a large portfolio of many stocks that are being bought and sold, you're better off with the fee-based. You don't pay commission with the fee-based, you just pay the fee. And also it comes out of your cash. You're not like, you don't have the pain of handing over that cash. It just comes out of the cash in your account. The so. other thing I wanna go back to, and it sort of um, dovetails with what I wanted to do to talk about. Melina, you talked about deducting the interest, but there is interest that can't be deducted now. Um, when you refinance your house, Maggie, am I correct about this? When you refinance your house and you go above that $750,000 mortgage, it's yeah. no longer going to be deductible. Um, it, and so yeah. you have to be really careful about that. So if you're buying your spouse out and you are, and your mortgage is more than 750, I think that's the number, 750,000. It was one yeah. of the laws that were passed just like probably about five years ago. Mm -hmm. You can no longer deduct that mortgage. And so you need to be aware of that as well as the fact, and this has been a big issue. And I don't know if you've seen this, Maggie, 
um, in your practice, but the refinancing of the house because of the fact that interest rates have gone up, mm -hmm. how has that affected people? That the fact that interest rates are now have, have actually um, really gone up and, and in a very, um, uh, they've gone up in uh, high, right? Yeah, it's interesting. I actually just had a, um, a long talk with one of our bankers yesterday talking about mortgage rates. And um, without getting like too granular and super boring um, to some people, um, the 10 year rates are actually lower than the um, five year rates. So it used to be like nobody wanted, nobody in their right mind wanted to get an adjustable rate mortgage which means that your rate is set for a period of time and then whatever it is when that time is up is your new rate so everybody says oh no you want to get a 30 year you want to get a 15 year well who would want to get a 30 year or 15 year right now the rates are so high so what people are actually doing is they're getting these adjustable rate mortgages so just so you know, if anyone here is buying a house, a 10 year adjustable rate mortgage is probably the safest bet at this point, which interesting. is interesting because years ago it was like the devil. Nobody wanted to get an adjustable rate mortgage, but it's actually a really good deal now. Interesting. So Melina, you talked about budgeting and um, what what do people do? What Where do they cut? Um, and when they have to start to cut because support isn't going to likely cover everything. Um, and so what, what do they start to look at? Well, I'll back up even to the, to the basic question of how do you even create a budget? And I think the overarching message is do what works for you. As long as you can access it, update it, see it, it doesn't scare you, you feel ownership over it, and it gives you good information, whether that's in Excel, whether that's in a, you know, even, I, I wouldn't say handwritten because it's hard to tabulate and calculate things at the end of the day. But if you are using an app, for example, that's also a really great way to have something, a system working your accounts and spitting out the numbers for you and giving you reminders. So I'm a big proponent. Okay, so I'm really tech, unsavvy okay we're at savvy ladies but i am like tech unsavvy <laughs> i'm tech aware but it took me until about a year ago to get on um the budget and expense and investing apps and so i have now kind of gotten over this hump of, of this arc this hump of realization that i've been missing out i've been mismanaging my finances or inefficiently managing my finances because i was not on an app so it took maybe 30 minutes in total to upload my savings, my checkings, and my investment accounts to this app. It was very easy. Um, that was something people think, oh my God, I have to go through all these accounts. It's pretty easy if you have online accounts. Number two, um, what, is, what am I actually seeing? What, are, what is an app giving me? An app is giving you a snapshot of expenses and categories of expenses. And then it's comparing them to past prior expenses to see if you're going up or down. It's also showing you where you can save costs. Um, the app, so I'll talk about which apps in a, in a they're minute. They're all now. dying to know. I'm getting, yeah, yeah, yeah. So these I'm, 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 chats I'm, I'm, are coming okay. in fast and furiously, which <laughs> app? Rocket, so somebody mentioned Rocket um, Mortgage. That's so, I'm not Rocket Mortgage, Rocket. Um, I, they also have Rocket Mortgage. I use Rocket because um, I really like the fact that it's simple, it's clear, the interface didn't take too long to set up. Like I mentioned, it was just uploading my accounts and then it takes a little time just to categorize your expenses. They'll ping you and say, oh, an unrecognized expense is this. And then you can categorize it as groceries or restaurant or wherever it belongs. But I like it because it also prompts you to where you can save on subscriptions. And we all have all these hidden subscriptions or not hidden and they'll negotiate the subscription cost down, even your electrical your electricity provider, for example, or even a television streaming subscription, but they'll also show you all these hidden costs that are lurking in your budget that you really weren't aware of. And they'll prompt you and ask you, do you need this? Do you want us, do you want to eliminate this? Do you want us to negotiate down? Um, there are a couple of articles, so that's just one. And I know people have heard of Mint um, and probably have a lot of familiar, familiarity with Mint and Mint was, into, was formerly Intuit's platform 
um, Intuit also does tur TurboTax, so it's a nice package. Um, but I don't know if you guys are aware, Intuit bought Credit Karma, which does your credit reporting and credit scoring. And so they decided to get rid of Mint and focus on their product under Credit Karma now for budgeting. People aren't too happy with that, but if you were formerly a Mint user, most apps or most platforms out there will give you a subsidized or a free access if you were a former Mint uh, user. And so Judy just put two articles that I would just urge people to quickly to, to just take bookmark in your in your browser. Um, Forbes and Fortune are pretty reputable sources. Um, you know, I'm not sure that they're fully incentivized to report these apps or these budgeting tools. I look through them and I kind of agree with what they say. They're pretty good in evaluating the pros and the cons. Some are geared more towards investing to get you to save money and do it in a systematic way or in a fun way where they gamify it. Some of them are about debt reduction. They're really about categorizing your debts, giving you options to consolidate your debts, and then giving you methodology, whether it's prompts or text or just a, a quick screenshot of you know, you're, you're, you pay down $300 this month, way to go. You're only 12 months, you know, from full pay down. That's also a great area that apps focus on. The other area is really just plain old expense budgeting, where you see the money coming in, tracks the money coming in, and then it tracks the money going out. And so you know where your money is going. I think that's the black box. We mm. think we know the, where the money is going. But where is it going? How many Starbucks runs do you do a week that you don't even think about? Okay, how many times does your kid want something at like the YMCA or the JCC from the snack machine and you give them the credit card? I mean, it adds up. And so get getting out of the dark and, and relying on something to give you the incoming cash flows, the outgoing cash flows. And then even if you're comfortable putting in your retirement, your savings accounts, will give you a sense of your of your savings at any given time, plus your credit card debt, your credit card bills, if you link your credit card. And these are encrypted, you know, I, I have trust in the system. So I would go through those two articles, look at a few of them, just download it and try it. If you, you'll kind of get a sense immediately whether or not you're comfortable with the interface. And I think it's really important and, and you have to be comfortable, obviously uploading your information and you want to be careful about that. And that goes to making sure that you get your credit report very often so that you could go through it and make sure that there's no issues with your, with your credit report, um, particularly as you're going through your divorce. Maggie, I, I think our women would love to hear some tips on how to make money on their money. So how, mm. what, do, what are like your three best tips on how to make money on your money? Gosh, okay. Um, wow, you caught me off guard here. With I this. know I did. I know, I know. <laughs> but I was just thinking about it. I, I heard Melina's oh. making money on her property and I'm thinking, okay, what else well, do listen, we have to do? I have to tell you, um, it's been an incredible run in the stock market. And um, I think that in, in working with a responsible financial advisor to build a risk appropriate portfolio for yourself is a fabulous choice. You know, we often say that a moderate portfolio is 60% stock, 40% bond. And if you have even a small amount of money, you know, you can do this yourself on a discount app um, and you can use it buying even just the S&P 500, which is an S, you know, SPY is an ETF that holds, um, you know, the, the, all the stocks in the S&P 500 index, which are the 500 largest companies. Um, there's a number of ways. I mean, there's a million ways to, you know, create a portfolio, but that would be sort of one basic way to approach it as 60% stock, 40% bonds. That would sort of be like a middle of the road vanilla portfolio. And, you know, bonds can, um, bonds are doing really well right now because their rates are very high so they're paying really good interest and they're also more conservative investments if you're a more conservative investor um, even treasury bonds are a terrific idea right now which are you know used to be sort of like you know a big yawn but now treasuries are doing great so honestly it is a 
in many ways, a great time to get divorced. If there is such a thing, I know that divorce is so difficult. And I just wanted to say super quick, which I did not say in the beginning. I know that I'm sitting here in my office, you know, and I met Lisa, I met you eight years ago, Lisa, I actually looked it up. Wow, you brought that great cheese platter to my office, Maggie, I'll never forget it. Oh, you you came and we had like what? Amazing. We had like 30 women in my office. And it was a phenomenal (laughs) night. And it really was. It was magical. It was. I I got it catered. I had like a a charcuterie board catered. Oh my gosh. It was amazing. Anyway, when I met Lisa, you know, it was very soon after my divorce. Maybe it was a few more years than that. But, um, you know, I'm sitting here now and I work at Morgan Stanley. And honestly, I could pinch myself. When I got divorced, which, um, you know, I was in a situation where I had to separate from my husband for my safety. And I know there are people out there who understand what I'm talking about. So it was an urgent, necessary thing I had to do for my own safety and my children's safety. It was incredibly difficult. Um, I hadn't worked for 15 years. I was a stay-at-home mom in Chappaqua. I had a four bedroom house and a BMW in the driveway and I hadn't worked for 15 years. My husband wasn't working and he had no desire to pay me a dime, a dime. So that's where I was. And in addition, I had, you know, I had three young teenagers and I joke that the day my husband walked out the door, three young teenagers, three dogs and five cats. And I didn't have a job and I had no income. So trust me when I say, I understand what it means to be up a creek. I really, really do. And it's a long road, but you know, I am evidence today that you can rebuild your life, you can start over and you can create whatever life you want for yourself. And it is absolutely doable. And Lisa's right, you do have to be fearless. You know, you do have to believe that it's possible So that's really what I'm hoping that the women here come away with is the knowledge that it is possible for you. And if you probably never would have dreamed that five years ago, you'd be sitting in this spot watching this video, right? (laughs) In the same way, there is no telling what your life will be like five years from now. Anything is possible. And that's really the truth. And I just really want to extend like my very, very best wishes to everyone here that, you know, you're able to make your dreams come true because I know that you can. So. And Maggie, I, can I, can I add a third way to invest your money? Sure. Because I have to say that my bias and my vantage point is from education. So I work at Columbia business school. I actually did a reverse decision where I left wall street when I was going through my divorce. And I decided to take a very interesting, way more fun, way more challenging, but rewarding job in education, which was the salary cut by a lot. But I knew I could drop my daughter off at school, pick my daughter up from school, um, choose a preschool next to Columbia, uh, walk to work, walk home from work to breastfeed at lunch. I chose that I restructured my life and I had to do it by taking a lesser paying job. I don't recommend that. It's not a a, a one size fits all solution, but it's something to consider when you are the primary breadwinner or the equal breadwinner and you are suddenly going to be a single parent and you're looking at the nanny cost or you're looking at the the emotional cost of having your child, you know, away from you now part of the time. So the third way to invest your money is in yourself through education. And again, pre-COVID, we really didn't have as many online options as we do now. So Invest in courses online or through community college or local colleges, but invest in courses online. Coursera is a great resource. You can get, you can pick any topic under the sun and look for courses for just interest. You can look for certifications, um, certificates, which kind of give you a, a, you know, a bona fide stamp on your resume that you can say I have a certificate in sustainable investing or I have a certificate in human resource management or I have a certificate, uh, you know, in in coaching. Um, But this is really important because training and courses are accessible now. You don't have to physically drive anywhere. 
and they will give your credentials a step up or a step back into the workplace. And you can look at areas that you were always interested in doing. Um, you can also look at the marketplace to see what those services are valued because there's platforms like Upwork, for example, where you can hire people to do almost anything to, and you can see what people are charging. Um, and these are just independent contractors, but courses, certificates, training, really, really great investment of your time and money, and also conferences. If you're just trying to get awareness about industries, regain your footing, kind of, and what it even feels like to be a professional, mm -hmm. dress up, put on a nice cute blazer, put on some funky earrings and get your notebook and get your resumes, but get yourself ready to learn and go to, you know, go somewhere, I'm assuming a lot of these people Maybe if you have access to a metropolitan area, whether it's San Francisco, Houston, New York City, Chicago, wherever, conferences are being held all the time. And try and go. And if you they require a fee, write to the conference administrator and ask if they could waive the fee. Um, and that's another thing to do, ask. Always ask. I have to shout out to Lisa and Precious Williams who are putting together a podcast called The Power of the Ask. Oh my God, we think just because something's written or something is done the way it is or something's the status quo that we can't ask for something different. Mm -hmm. Ask if conference fees can be waived. Ask if you can audit a course at a local university. Ask if you can earn more or take on a new responsibility in your current job because you wanna make more money. Ask for a flexible schedule because you need to do drop-offs and pickups on these days. Ask for whatever it is and ask with respect and ask with honesty and don't feel like you're doing something wrong, but that's something I'm incorporating in my life more. And I'm really thankful to Precious and Lisa for inspiring me to use my voice and gosh darn it, ask. Don't be afraid. <laughs> thank you so much, um, Melina. And thank you, Maggie. And um, we're gonna answer a few questions. And I will say, um, mm -hmm. Judy has put up the, um, a, a, the link for Savvy Ladies, the podcast, Power of the Ask. We are um, going to be launching it, I believe in February, look for it. We will send out notifications. It is the Savvy Ladies, Power of the Ask. And we already have some incredible women who we have interviewed and you'll be able to hear us once a month. Um, interesting stories, so inspirational, really incredibly inspirational women who have gone through so much and are helping so many women. So, um, it, it's great. And yes, time flies as someone just said in these, in these chats, somebody asked about health insurance. I want to answer that question because it's an important question. Um, your health insurance, usually there's something called automatic orders. When you file for divorce, there's an automatic order in the filing, Whoever is carrying the health insurance for the um, for the family or for you should actually be required to keep the health insurance in place until there is a judgment of divorce. So mm -hmm. you should make sure, was there an automatic order? Consult with your attorney. Um, nobody should be able to cancel that insurance. And then you could be eligible for um, continuing um, health insurance through COBRA, depending upon um, who was carrying the health insurance and how it was carried. And in divorce, it's for three years that COBRA goes on for. It's expensive, I'm going to tell you that, but it's comparable insurance. Um, it's basically your same insurance. And um, and if you're not employed and don't have health insurance, that may be the solution. Your spouse likely won't be required to um, pay for the COBRA um, because that may be part of your spousal support. Um, but it is something that you should definitely speak to your attorney about. Um, so that, that I think is really important. And I want to, um, there was a couple of other questions, Judy, maybe uh, somebody said that they had an inheritance um, that they were keeping in set savings and that it was separate and not marital um, and that they wanted it in case they needed to live on. Um, I don't know what the equitable distribution is in that particular case and if they will need that to live on. And I think that is something, um, the question was, what should I do with it instead? I think that um, you might want to speak to a financial advisor. Maybe um, maybe there's nothing, by the way, you can do instead because of these automatic orders. Mm -hmm. So 
You're not allowed to make transfers, um, large transfers during a divorce action in New York, in New York without permission, either from your spouse or through the attorneys or through the court. So be careful what you just decide. I know it's separate, but even if it's separate, the automatic orders apply. So mm -hmm. you need to actually consult with an attorney before you move any monies to mm -hmm. any place else, but there might be better places to put it. And if it's logical and reasonable, somebody should be agreeing uh, about it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just looking quickly through some of the other questions um, that um, somebody said, I'm ready to move out of the marital home and I'm paying the mortgage and bills 100%. Um, my husband is refusing to agree and move on. What do you advise? <coughs> it, you know, here's the thing. You can't sell, nobody could force usually a house to be sold during a matrimonial action. It has to come to the end before the court actually has the authority to force a sale. So your, your best bet, obviously, is to speak to your attorney and see if there's anything that can be done in terms of maybe your husband contributing. Um, but understand that you may just have to get to that end before um, somebody moves that before the house can be sold and before you can actually um, have your spouse move out again something to consult with your attorney about um, and somebody else um, talked about my my financial advisor told me to stop renting and buying a and buy a home instead I think it depends on the situation look this is not a one-size-fits-all for anybody mm -hmm. and this is General advice, we see a lot, all of us, during um, our experience as we work with um, women in divorce and, and work with men in divorce. And um, we just, we see a lot of the, the things that come back to us afterwards that um, maybe weren't the smartest ideas. And so from that experience, we're trying to just lend um, some advice here, but it's not a one size fits all. Right. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank Maggie, Patrick, and thank you for your sponsorship of Savvy Ladies. And thank you for being a volunteer. And thank you, Melina. Um, you are always such a great um, person to have on these Savvy Ladies hours. And we really appreciate everything that you've done for Savvy Ladies. And um, I want to thank Tracy Wheeler and Judy Herbst for organizing it and for all the Savvy Ladies out there. And, and please tune in for next week. We're going to be talking about trusts and estates and wills and prenups and postups. And although you may think that some of it doesn't apply, it's going to apply for your kids at some point, it may apply for you. Um, the wills and the trusts and the estates are going to apply now. Powers of attorney, um, healthcare proxies, all of that we're going to be discussing next week. So um, it, it would be a great, um, it's our last panel. And I think it'll be a really interesting panel to have. And we have someone um, who actually is able to talk about her experience going through divorce and why it's so important to protect yourself. So we'll look forward to seeing you all next week. And can I just say one last thing? I just wanted to say thank you to Judy and to Tracy and to Lisa so much. It's such an honor to be here with you, Melina. Um, and I just want to invite anyone who is on the call today, if you would like a consultation, you know, totally complimentary, I'm happy to like to talk through financial questions with anyone at all who's on the call. I don't know if Judy has put our information up in the chat, but um, I, I really would be delighted to talk to anyone, no matter what your circumstances are. That's great, Maggie. And we really appreciate that. We really appreciate that. And um, come also and to the helpline as well. Maggie is a volunteer on the helpline, so you can get connected there as well. And I will put everyone's contact information here for you guys to reach out to them as well. Great. And likewise, Maggie, thanks for, I mean, I, I learn a lot with, every woman I speak with throughout all these panels and throughout the organization. And there's just a lot of talent and a lot of heart and a lot of stories, a lot of personal growth. But I also am more than happy to speak with anyone, just chat for 30 minutes about your situation. If you're looking for referrals, that's part of what being a divorce coach is also giving you good referrals, um, being like an air traffic controller, where do you go? Um, but just happy to lend 30 minutes of my time and have a chat with whatever's on your mind. Thank you both so much. You, you're both Wonderful. so generous. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Lisa, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks, okay. Melina. Thanks, Bye, Maggie. Everyone. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Thanks.